So everyone, I as we're admitting, yeah, we're going to hit, I think we're going to get perfect attendance, which is great. Everyone, I want to take a moment. My name is Frances Quell. I'm the director of this magnificent program, and I'm really lucky because I get to work within this community of parents who are so, you know, they just, they cherish their children. They love their children. Their kids are their whole entire world, and they actually are willing to share their kids with me sometimes and with my program, and that really means a lot to me. So I just want to say thank you for trusting the Queller Prep program, for listening to the webinars, for mentioning Queller Prep to friends and to families, for, you know, telling your cousins and your neighbors to come to Queller, because that's really the biggest compliment that, you know, anyone could ever receive. And um, I can't tell you how much it means to hear that someone went to Queller a few years ago and now graduated from college. So it really means a lot. I just want to share that with you. And as we're waiting for just one or two more people to join, I also want to take a moment um, just to use this opportunity to thank Michael Courtney, because you have provided literally 20 plus years of guidance, assistance, honesty, last minute text messages, emails, um, phone calls of the most random questions related to college admissions. And I've learned so much. And I really want to thank you. I want to specifically thank you for hosting this webinar in person in Queller Prep Queens, in person in Manhattan, and literally doing this via Zoom right now. And hopefully we go back to in person soon. So I want to start the webinar by saying thank you. I know you're really supposed to do this at the end, but I really want to take a moment to say this now because um, towards the end, as we wind down, just remember, this is someone who's sincerely speaking, unscripted, unrehearsed, just really speaking from the heart saying, look, this is the knowledge I know. I'm going to share it with you. And I want you to know this too. So I really just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to all the parents who refer and recommend Queller to their friends, to their family, to their neighbors. Remember that we need to keep these programs going. We need to keep pushing these programs. Michael, thank you for referring your own friends and family to this program. I hope that they're very happy here. And I really hope that, you know, I get to witness their growth and their college acceptances. It's really cool. Okay. So I'm happy to be a part of this moment with all of you. I just want to remind all of you that I myself am a child of immigrants. My parents came from Russia, from Moldova, and um, they did not go to college in the United States. So I just want to remind you that my journey and how tough it was to navigate New York University, where I actually met Michael Courtney, and we, you know, through these years have stayed in touch and learned so much, so much that I'm able to share with you today. So just remember that, you know, a lot of this I didn't know when I was going, I, there was no Queller Prep. I, doesn't that sound so funny? So I just want to remi remind you, Queller Prep was not around, so I had to figure everything out. And here we are today passing the torch. And I want to remind the students who are listening right now that that's very important. That should be an important life goal to pass the torch, pass the wisdom to the next generation, because it's one of the most important things you'll ever do in your life is to enable and empower someone to understand how to streamline a hard and tough journey. So please don't forget the value of helping the next generation. And that's something that we do every single day and I'm very thankful for. Without further ado, it is an honor to introduce Michael Courtney and thank you all for listening. I will be behind the scenes in video and on mute and you can type any questions you have into the chat box. This is your opportunity. Thank you, Michael, let's go. All right, and during the session, I might answer chat questions along the way, might get to some of them towards the end, depending on timing, but I'll definitely notice all questions that are in the chat. So to introduce myself again, for those who just came in the last few minutes, my name is Michael Courtney. I am Director of College Counseling at SAR High School, a private school in Riverdale, New York. Formerly worked at New York University in admissions, and I went to NYU for my undergrad and master's. For those who are interested, feel free to show your faces so you can see more people as opposed to just names on the screen. So when it comes to competitive college admission, I've thankfully had experience working with students who have gone to a gamut of schools across the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, the West. And there are a lot of things to think about when it comes to the admission process. So a few things to consider. One is the size of the school you're looking for. When you see a FISC guide or one of those other types of publications, it might seem overwhelming. There is a plethora of information out there and every school might feel the same. So a good way to reduce the size is to think about the type of school you're looking for. A small school tends to be 5,000 and fewer undergraduates, medium size 5,000 to 10,000, and large 10,000 or above. So there are different types of schools that fall under these types, whether they're private or public, 
whether they are urban, suburban, or rural, whether they are closer to New York or much further from New York. But the idea is that starting with size can get you to reduce the list of places that you're thinking about. If you look at different types of publications, they might rank schools based on liberal arts colleges versus research universities. So liberal arts colleges might be the Amhersts and Williams and Bowdens and Swarthmore's of the world and research universities could be the schools in the Ivy League, University of Chicago, Stanford University, New York University, et cetera. So looking at those types of schools, you might think to yourself, a small liberal arts college might make more sense versus a larger research university. And the converse can be true. You might be someone who will be happy anywhere, whether it's small, medium, or large. But in thinking about how to reduce a list, that's a good place to get started. A school that has a smaller population might feel a little bit more intimate. You might recognize a lot more faces as you pass the corridors of the main academic building or the quad. You might have more professor interaction. You might have fewer teacher assistants teaching classes, and it could be a nice intimate feeling on campus for those four years. A larger university might have more course opportunities, might have certain majors or minors that smaller schools won't offer necessarily. You might have more colleges within a larger university. So a small liberal arts college will prioritize the liberal arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, whereas a large research university might have a school dedicated to engineering, a school dedicated to business, a school dedicated to nursing, et cetera. So thinking about the professional path, if there is one particular route you're thinking as a rising high school college freshman, that could be a good idea to think about the larger university that might have those paths. When thinking about smaller schools versus larger schools, a larger school might have more campus spirit, might have the big football or basketball games that entice a lot of students. Greek life might feel different there, which is the fraternity of sorority life than in the smaller schools. And schools that are in the middle might have the advantages of both or the disadvantages of both. So someone might be happy at small, medium, or large, but that's a good place to get started when thinking about your list. You wanna think about location as well. For some students, they get the stimulation of an urban school and feel like there's a lot going on. There's high energy, whether you're in New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, DC. For other students, they might get their kicks out of a more remote atmosphere where the school is the only game in town, whether it's Hanover, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth is located, or Ithaca, New York, where both Cornell and Ithaca College are located. You might feel like one type of environment suits you better. Again, some people might be happy everywhere, but sometimes starting off your list by thinking of location types can be helpful. Something that's more suburban is a school that might be outside of a major city. However, your campus is still the main experience. So an example could be Tufts, which is outside of Boston, or University of Maryland, outside of Washington, DC, uh, Bryn Mawr, outside of Philadelphia. So these are examples of schools that have more of a suburban vibe the campus has its own experience, but you can easily access a major city within 40 minutes of the campus. So in thinking of schools, I mentioned size, I mentioned location. The primary reason you're going to college is academics, right? You're paying tuition for an education. Everything else is icing on the cake, whether it's a good Greek life, whether it is strong student organizations, whether it is really good location. So you have to think about the school and their academic mission. A school like Brown or Johns Hopkins, they have something called an open curriculum. They don't require you to take core curricular classes, which sounds amazing for some people, could sound intimidating for others. A school like Columbia or University of Chicago, they have a very rigid and defined core that really is the hallmark of the underclassmen experience. So you wanna see if the academic fit makes a lot of sense. When I used to work at NYU, people would ask all the time, uh, can I study fashion at NYU? The answer is no, and as a result, NYU shouldn't be on your list if fashion is your primary focus for college academics. So you wanna see if the schools you're considering actually has the major you're thinking about. I think what's interesting is sometimes students who are thinking pre-med aren't looking eight years, they're looking four years. They're looking for that brand name undergrad without thinking, is the pre-med rate going into medical school strong? So uh, Malcolm Gladwell actually wrote about this in one of his books, the idea that if you go to a school like Johns Hopkins or Washington University in St. Louis, where half the campus starts off pre-med, the goal is to weed out those that don't belong so they don't have low med school admit rates. So you might be better off going to certain schools where the pre-med um, academic advising doesn't feel as cutthroat 
and it feels more collaborative. These are types of nuances for you to look into. Uh, when thinking about academics, you also wanna think about the size of the classes. Are you okay with some, a class size that's gonna be very, very large? Or do you feel like you need to be in a class size that's a bit smaller? Sometimes students wanna consider if the classes are taught by professors who are tenured versus adjunct professors versus teacher assistants who might teach more of the underclassmen courses. So these are things to consider when it comes to um, the academics. Next, I would say you also wanna think about just the overall student life. If you're thinking of certain types of clubs on campus and they don't have them, that could be something to really worry about unless you could start it on your own. So sometimes students might be drawn to certain religious groups on campus, certain ethnic groups on campus, certain political persuasions. So if you feel very passionate about, about things that you've done in high school and you wanna find colleges that have like-minded communities, you'll have to do your research to see if that's the case. If you're someone who wants to go to a school where um, there are certain niche programs, you wanna make sure the school has those. So sometimes students will say to me, I wanna to go to a school that has a good psychology program. The good news is every college will have good psychology, biology, English, history. Why? Because those are the most popular majors for incoming freshmen. So universities are pouring a lot of funding into these types of departments. But if you're looking for something that's very out of the box, like sports management, that might be stronger at some schools than others. Um, or something as eclectic as a real estate program. Some schools might have that, others won't. So you definitely wanna see if the academic fit makes sense, the location makes sense, the student organizations make sense, the size of the school. So when thinking about how to do research for colleges, something you wanna consider is, are you demonstrating interest? Now, demonstrating interest is something a number of schools track. They're looking to see if you're joining their admissions mailing list. So right now, some homework for tonight after the session is if you have schools of interest, Google the name of the school, Google Vanderbilt University admissions mailing list, and they'll give you an inquiry form to fill out. And you should be doing that for all the schools that are of interest to you. Some schools do not track demonstrated interest, but being on their mailing list, you might learn more information about the school that'll help inform your supplemental essays later for the applications. The other thing about demonstrating interest, some schools are looking at this closely because they wanna know that if they admit someone, they're not wasting an acceptance, right? If they admit someone regular decision, their goal is to somehow yield that student so the student matriculates. So how do you demonstrate interest? You do it through joining admission mailing lists, visiting campus tours if possible. With COVID, things have been different, but some campuses will have in-person information sessions, campus tours, or they might do online webinars or Zooms. So being able to join some of those. Campuses all have virtual tours on their website. So if you have to register for those, that demonstrates interest. If an admission representative comes to your high school, going to that session, filling out an inquiry form, that shows interest. If a school has an optional interview, making sure to do that as well helps demonstrate interest. So that's a part of the process when it comes to schools that have demonstrated interest as a factor in admission. When it comes to the admission process and the competitive landscape, and I'm gonna give you some trivia here so you can feel free to chat. There are certain types of terms that you need to know about. So let's talk about the idea of early decision. Who here thinks they know what early decision is and can type in the chat what that refers to? Okay, I'm not seeing many chat takers, but it could be you're in the process of typing. So early decision, good. Someone wrote, if you apply early and they accept you, you have to go, good. So early decision is a part of the admission process where a student will apply earlier in their senior year. It's typically about November 1st, and you find out earlier within a smaller applicant pool. So you'll find out in mid-December, and early decision means that if they offer you acceptance, that means you're bound to take it. So a reason you don't have to go is let's say they give you far less financial aid than you were expecting, then you didn't have to, they wouldn't have to go. It's not a prison sentence, but the expectation is that they offer you admission that you're coming to that school. So if you need to compare aid packages, you can't do that through early decision. Prior to applying, you can fill something out called a net price calculator 
which every college has in their financial aid website. So you could see based on prior year tax figures, what a financial aid package could look like. So that's something I'd recommend to every family here who's thinking about colleges in the context of financial aid. When it comes to early decision, it tends to be for the most part a private school phenomenon. A lot of very competitive schools will have early decision. Some schools will say, not that big of a difference between early and regular. For the most part, there is a big difference. So early decision, you apply by November 1st. You find out mid-December. If admitted, you are done with the admission process. Who here has heard of early action? Feel free to type in the chat. And the chats are all private message. So I know you guys don't publicly see it, but I'm seeing it. So as you're thinking, so early decision is binding. Early action is non-binding. Early action tends to be a bit more of a public school phenomenon. So the idea is that schools like University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, uh, Indiana University may offer a November 1st deadline. You find out earlier in the process than regular decision. So you find out somewhere between mid-December to mid to late January, depending on the year. But if offered admission, you're not bound to go. You still have until May 1st to look at all your different offers and make an informed decision. So think of it this way, early action, you're dating, early decision, you're ready to get married. So with early action, you can apply to multiple schools. You can apply to three or four schools early action. You can apply to six or seven schools early action, but you can only do one school early decision. And you can do an early decision with multiple early actions, but if admitted to the early decision school, you'd withdraw all those early action applications. So early decision, you're ready to commit to a school, it's your first choice, you know that if accepted, you're gonna go there. Early action, you're very interested in the school, you're applying at an earlier deadline, but if they admit you, you don't have to go. Now, here's the thing to know, if you're applying to an out-of-state school, you must hit that early action deadline to give yourself a better chance of getting in. If you apply to Michigan November 2nd, you are not getting in. I'm telling you this now, if you're from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Michigan has for their in-state quota, a number of students they have to take to satisfy their government, and they have an out-of-state number. They're satisfying the out-of-state figures for their early action deadlines, okay? So that's something to think about. You have state schools on your list, make sure to hit their November 1st, or some schools might have November 15th, make sure to hit their early action deadline. So I said early decision, I said early action. Who here has heard of restrictive early action? And if you haven't heard of it, that's okay. It's not as common. Restrictive early action is something that's offered by Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. And it's the idea that if you apply early, but you get in, you're not bound to go. So it's not early decision, which is binding. What's restrictive about it is that you cannot do a Harvard early and a Columbia early decision. You can only do one school restrictive early action. So you can't do both Harvard and Yale restrictive early action. You can't do Princeton and Barnard restrictive early action and early decision. So it's still like your lone private school early school. You could still do it alongside other early action schools. So you could do Stanford alongside um, University of Maryland alongside University of Texas in Austin, that's possible. Another term to know, so I was asked, can I repeat restrictive early action? Restrictive early action is something that Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford have. What's restrictive is you cannot do that school with another restrictive early action. So you can't do both Princeton and Yale early applications, nor can you do one of those schools, like let's say Harvard, together with an early decision. You can't do Harvard and Penn early. So it's the idea, it's the only school you're doing an early action or early decision deadline for alongside state schools that you're still eligible for, okay? So there's a question, what is the advantage of doing early action, early decision? The advantage is you're in a smaller applicant pool. And for some schools, their admission rate is definitely more favorable early than regular. Schools like Yale, Penn, I'm sorry, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford, the difference between early and regular isn't as vast as it is for Harvard. Harvard, your chances are better early than regular. When it comes to early decision, schools like Brown, schools like University of Chicago, schools like Washington University in St. Louis, they have a big disparity between their early and regular. And you're gonna to wanna to hit that early decision if you can. 
Schools also might have something called early decision two. Has anyone here heard of ED2? As you might be typing away in the chat, ED2 is something that schools might offer. Not every school has it. It's more of a private school phenomenon. The Ivy League schools do not offer it, but extremely selective schools otherwise do. Johns Hopkins, NYU, Emory, Vanderbilt, Wash U, and St. Louis, they have something called ED2. ED2 means you apply by January 1st, which is also the regular decision deadline. If admitted, you find out early to mid-February, so you're still in a smaller pool of applicants. And if admitted, you're done with the admission process, you withdraw any other applications because that's the school you're committed to. So who's doing an ED2? Let's say someone applies to Washington University in St. Louis by January 1st. It could be they do that because they weren't admitted to their ED1 school. Maybe they tried for Penn and they weren't admitted. Or it could be they just weren't ready to commit to a school by November 1st because they're still counting on December testing to help their chances or because they need more time to do research. So ED2, it's also very selective, but not like regular decision. So schools that have ED1 and ED2, ED is very competitive. ED2 a little bit more, then regular is a whole other level. In highly selective admission, you do not wanna be in the regular decision pool if you can avoid it. So for schools that have ED1, ED2, they have two different rounds of giving you options of getting in that makes regular decision ultra competitive. So the idea is that some of these schools will take 55, 60% of their classes through ED1, ED2. Not a 60% admit rate, but they'll take about 60% of their classes through ED1, ED2, which means in regular, where the application numbers have swelled to a whole new degree, the chances of getting in go down precipitously. Who here has heard of rolling admission? As you're typing in, I'm just gonna answer some questions here. Do schools set aside a percentage of admission for EAED? Yes, they have numbers in mind. The enrollment managers think how much of the class they wanna admit through those deadlines. The question also I'm seeing is, do you recommend doing ED2 if you applied ED1 and didn't get in? Yes, you might wanna to think to yourself, what's your one-two punch? What are you doing ED1 or restrictive early action? If not admitted to that, what are you doing ED2? Again, you don't want to be in the regular decision pool for the most competitive colleges. So to answer the question, rolling admission means that as the school progresses, admission offices will roll out decisions, and you might find out about six weeks after applying. University of Pittsburgh is known for rolling admission. And the earlier you apply in the year, the better your chances are. So if you apply in September, you have a better chance of getting in than if you try in February, because the class is filling up and filling up as the year progresses. So when it comes to the competitive landscape, you wanna think about how to maximize your application chances. And there is a strategy here. And the idea of figuring out what's the right ED1, ED2 school or restrictive early action. And the one takeaway I'll tell you for tonight has to be that for any state school that has these early deadlines, you gotta hit those early deadlines. So yes, this makes the admission process front loaded. And it's not a second semester senior year phenomenon. It really is right away in senior year. So you really have to get prepared for this process as a junior. Okay, so let's talk about what are the factors in admission that schools are looking for. So first and foremost, they look at the transcript. So the transcript is four years worth of coursework, 9, 10, 11, and 12, three years worth of end of the year grades. If you apply anywhere early decision, they could ask for first quarter grades, how you're doing those first two months of the year. Otherwise, schools will see your first semester transcript of senior year. And wherever you ultimately deposit, that school will see your final transcript after you graduate. When it comes to the transcript, schools are looking at a few things. One is your curricular rigor. How are you challenging yourself within the context of your high school? Some high schools might offer international baccalaureate programs. Some high schools might offer a series of advanced placement courses. Some high schools might have only honors courses. So the idea is that colleges know what your schools have to offer because your high schools have something called a school profile that they present to college admission offices every fall. So I work at a school where a student cannot take more than four APs. That is the absolute maximum. If someone's applying to one of the more competitive schools, they better have four APs to have a chance at those schools. If you go to a school where you have a maximum of six APs, the most competitive schools will expect you to take six APs. If you go to a school where the maximum is 20, they're not expecting 20, but they're expecting a healthy number 
to showcase your curricular rigor. They do prioritize what they call the academic majors, English, history, math, science, world language. Those are the five most important subjects. Colleges will see everything on a transcript. They'll see phys ed, they'll see journalism, they'll see economics, they'll see driver's ed, but they really look at the five academic majors with utmost importance. So looking to see that you're in a strong curriculum and you're taking these types of classes throughout. Now, let's say you only do three years of world language, not four years, because instead of senior year Spanish 12, you're doing AP psychology. That's okay. The idea is that you're replacing one of these majors with maybe an AP or maybe a second history class senior year or second math class. When it comes to transcript, if you're applying to certain specific schools, let's say engineering, they're gonna look very closely at the math and science progression. They are taking the most rigorous curriculum in math up to let's say BC calculus, if your school offers that or multivariable calculus, and that you're taking AP physics and or AP chemistry if it's offered at your school. If you're thinking of applying for nursing, they're gonna look at your science sequence very closely. If you're thinking business, they're looking at your math sequence. This is in addition to the rest of the transcript. So sometimes students might think I will take the easiest classes to get straight A's. Admission offices know that. So the more competitive schools are looking for the highest possible grades within the most demanding curriculum. It definitely places a lot of stress on students. You should not be overreaching with your curriculum. So what does that mean? If you're not a strong math student, to be taking BC Calc might not make the most sense because your grades matter. And also your mental health matters. You have to be in the right curriculum where you belong. If you're not a strong writer, don't say I want to take AP English to become a better writer. AP English is for students who are already established strong writers. So you want to think about taking the right curriculum that makes sense for you. There is almost like um like a hierarchy within the AP world. Colleges look at AP calc and physics and bio and European history differently than they do AP art, AP music theory, AP psychology, AP government. So if you're applying for music school, AP music theory is great, obviously. If you're applying for an art school, AP studio art is great. There's nothing wrong with those classes if you're applying for general liberal arts, but to choose one of those over a better regarded AP could have some different results. So you wanna think about taking the right curriculum that makes sense for you. And if you're able to push yourself into more competitive uh, academic tracking because you have the grades for it, you have the capability to balance well, then that's a good idea. And balance is very important with the process. So let's say you're taking six classes senior year, think of college admission as your seventh class. There'll be essays to write, there'll be deadlines to meet, there'll be homework to do. So transcript is the most important document to colleges. Next will be standardized testing. So let's talk about standardized testing. Until the pandemic, SAT, ACT was a very important part of the process. Now it is still important if you have high scores to present. If you don't have high scores to present, they'll look at the other factors with greater weight. So colleges are test optional for the senior class. A lot of colleges have announced for the junior class. They haven't all yet. I think they all will. And colleges may be test optional for the sophomore freshman class and beyond because colleges are happy with the application numbers being through the roof. In case you haven't heard because of the pandemic, application numbers are extremely high because students can go test optional. So when it comes to testing, SAT, ACT is still there and very high scores can benefit a student. Very low scores means you won't present them, you go test optional. So here's how I look at it. Let's say before the pandemic, the five major components for admission were transcript, testing, extracurricular activities, essays, and recommendation letters. Let's say each were worth 20% of an admission review. If you take away testing, it's 25, 25, 25, 25. So they're just looking at those four with greater weight. If you have the testing, you're at 20 for 20. So there's an advantage to very high scores. There's no disadvantage to modest scores as long as the other components can make up for it. Make sense? So when it comes to testing, there's SAT or ACT and Quello Prep does prepare students very well for either. The SAT measures evidence-based reading and writing along with mathematics. The ACT is English, math, reading, and science. Sometimes parents wonder, do colleges have a preference of one or the other? It used to be the East Coast, West Coast were more SAT-based and the Midwest was more ACT-based. Colleges don't care. They're just happy to have higher scores to bump up their 
uh, status with U.S. News and World Report. So what does that mean? U.S. News and World Report is the preeminent publication for rankings and college admission folks pay attention to that to see where they rank. Because of the test optional landscape, the average testing numbers have increased dramatically at all these schools. Why? People are only reporting their scores if they fall within range for a school's admission criteria. The way you know what a school's admission criteria is for testing, you can Google any name. Let's say you wanna Google Brandeis University, middle 50%, SAT, ACT, just like that. And you'll get the exact figure from last year's class, the middle 50%. So that means, let's say it was just making up a number 1350 to 1500. That means 25% of admitted students had above a 1500, 25% of admitted students had below a 1350, and the 50%, the biggest number in the class, is between that range. Students want to be in the higher end of any range that is given from a school, especially if they have no hook. What's a hook if you're a recruited athlete? If you're a recruited musician, if you have a major legacy connection, if you have a development case, which means you have money to offer a school to be uh, in, in high standing in their uh, thinking. So the idea is that if you don't have a hook and a school presents a middle 50%, it's a good idea to be at the higher end of that middle 50%. Let's say a school says our middle 50% is 31 to 35. I saw that yesterday when I was working with a student. That means literally 25% of admitted students had a 36 perfect score. So getting a perfect score does not guarantee admission. It shows you that you're in the higher rate of the middle 50% though. So transcript and testing are two important factors. When it comes to testing, parents should be excited. SAT subject texts are now extinct. College Board got rid of SAT subject tests last year. Uh, admission offices look more at SAT or ACT or AP scores. So AP scores are important. The letter grade at the end of the year that your teacher gives you is even more important. Colleges care more about the eight months or nine months of your class than the one day of the AP exam. However, presenting very high AP scores can only help your application. It can also help out with credits. Uh, wherever college you go to when it comes to their advising might place you in higher level classes or give you classes to exempt um, coursework because of your AP scores. Typically a four or a five is recommended. Some schools give for a three. Binghamton gives for three. Uh, University of California system gives for three. For the most part, four or five. Next factors to look into, extracurricular activities. So here's an important part of the admission process. When students say, I'm not gonna join clubs, I'm just gonna focus on my schoolwork. And I hear that a lot freshman year, it's a big mistake. Colleges are looking for students with multi-year commitments. And they're asking how many hours per week, weeks per year, are you part of this activity? So the common application, which is the main vehicle for applying to most schools, lets you list up to 10 different activities in that section. And they're not expecting 10 activities of crazy number of hours a week, weeks per year, but they're looking at that top four or five very carefully. So if a student runs a club and the club never meets, it doesn't count for anything. Colleges want to know that there's sustained commitment. So colleges are looking for students who have an array of activities. There's no formula. Someone will say to me, I have this, I have that, I have this, but I don't have athletics. That's okay, not everyone's an athlete. Or they'll say, I have this, I have that, and the other, but I don't have publications. That's okay, not everyone writes for an official publication. The idea is that colleges are looking for the quality of the commitment, multi-year and multi-hours into, that, into that, that occasion, and they're looking for leadership captains of teams, founders of clubs, presidents of organizations. They're looking for people who may have done something that's out of the box, what makes you a change agent. Schools in the Ivy League and of that ilk, we'll see it's a dime a dozen how many kids have multiple leadership positions in their school. What they're looking for is the separation factor. What does a student have that makes them compelling within the greater context of a massive applicant pool? Or as a colleague of mine at an Ivy League school once said, what's your power? It's a hard question to ask a high school student, but that's what they're looking for. They're looking for someone who's made change and made society a better place. So I tell students, think of what your passion is. How do you translate that passion beyond you and your school? So I had a student who was an ice hockey player. He decided to give ice hockey lessons in an impoverished community. It didn't really have access to this type of sport, but had an interest in it. Uh, if I have a student who is interested in 
uh, doing community service, colleges aren't as impressed by someone who goes to Costa Rica or goes to Africa as they are with people who do community service in their backyard. So forget that $6,000 trip, do community service in your community, that impresses. Um, I had a student who was very interested in feminist issues. She read books to a domestic violence shelter for women who have been battered. And she read books to those kids of those women. That's something very meaningful to admission officers. So it's not just something that you're interested in, feminism, it's how do you use that interest to cultivate growth in an opportunity that'll make you stand out. That's the most competitive schools we'll be looking for. So yes, they're happy to have athletes and writers and thespians and choir singers, but they're looking to see how are you separating when it comes to this process. Parents will ask me all the time about what summer opportunity do I need to do? Now, my answer is this. If you have a full resume during the school year, you can enjoy the summer. If your resume during the school year isn't that impressive, take advantage of your summers to do something productive, whether it's doing an academic program at a college that looks at demonstrating interest, or maybe it's doing some type of community service program. <clears throat> maybe it's getting certification in something. Online certification is pretty popular these days, and you can get certain certifications online in four weeks, six weeks, that can impress an admission office. I had a student once whose goal was to read 50 books in the summer, and she did. And she listed all 50 books on her application. That's cool, that's a little out of the box. So the idea is that there's not one summer program that's the magic formula. But I will say, if you're interested in engineering specifically and how competitive that world is, they are looking to know that you understand what you put in the application, if it's mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or chemical engineering, and you've had some exposure to that beyond just you love Legos and you're good at math and science. They're looking to see that there's really a connection to the engineering stratosphere. When it comes to extracurricular engagement, sometimes students might vacillate. I do this thing in ninth grade, I switched to this in 10th, I started something else in 11th. The multi-year commitment should be two to three years. So if you don't have stuff that's all four years across the board, that's okay. I do recommend starting activities in ninth grade though for one's personal growth and development and to develop an opportunity for leadership by junior year, senior year. You typically have to be in activity for a couple of years before. So whether it's an academic team, model UN, mock trial, debate, model Congress, or it's a publication, yearbook, newspaper, lit mag, or it is an artistic club of some kind, Think about your passion. How do you cultivate that passion extracurricularly in school, out of school? And for the most competitive colleges, how are you gonna separate? That's what you gotta think about. Next, let's talk about another important factor in admission would be the idea of the college essay and essays plural. So the Common App allows you to apply to many schools at once using one generic essay. And there are different prompts, but when it all comes down to it, it's writing about yourself, your personal statement in some capacity. So it's not about how awesome your grandma is, it's about how awesome your grandma is in relation to you. Think about what your story is. And if you're not sure what your story is, look at their prompts. The prompts are very pointed and they'll give you a good idea as to how to answer a question. The biggest mistake people make is they'll spend months and months and months in the college essay and very little time on the supplemental essays. So what are supplemental essays? The more competitive schools have essays tailored to their particular institutions. Why do you want to go to this university? Or what do you want to study at this university? Why do you want to study it? Or tell us about a community you're from and how that community has shaped you. I've seen students spend so much time on the main essay and supplemental essays they're like, oh, that's quick. I'll do it in half an hour. You got to devote a lot of time to the supplemental essays as well. Those are just as, if not more important than the main common app essay. University of Chicago has such an interesting supplemental essay. They have a supplemental essay, why do you wanna to go to Chicago? Fine. But they have another one that you could choose from different prompts. One of them is find X. One of them is where's Waldo? One of them is about heroes and villains. Who is your villain? So the idea is that if these questions are too hard for you, then that school might not be the right school for you. So it's meant to be that the essays mirror what the school culture is like. Columbia asks you to list all the books you've read for pleasure in high school. If that is a short list, Columbia is not the school for you. If you're not an avid reader, uh, Columbia asks to list all the lectures, exhibits, films that you've seen in high school. If that's a short list, Columbia is not the school for you. And now in the virtual world, you can visit every museum in New York City from the comforts of your own home. So you can visit lectures on webinar, that's okay. So you actually have that advantage, but they're expecting a long list. 
when Columbia asks for books that you've read for pleasure, they're expecting those books to mirror the academic areas of interest that you put in the application. So if they ask you to list three areas of interest and you put biology, economics, and history, they're expecting that you've read books about biology, books about history, books about economics. These are things to think about when it comes to these schools that ask very pointed questions. Stanford asks you to write a letter to your future roommate. That is just as important as the college essay. Uh, Yale asks some questions in 35 words or less. That's a skill to write a really good essay in 35 words or less where there's no wasted word. There's no fluff there. So when it comes to the essay part of the application, it is something people will spend a lot of time with. If you have to hire someone to help write an essay and you can't do it yourself, competitive colleges might not be for you. You need to be able to write your own essay. You can have someone help you with looking at your rough draft, but no one should be sitting there writing it with you. This should be an individual process where you shut down your social media, you close the door to your parents and siblings, and you're able to just free write. And then once you have a draft, you could show it to your college counselor, your English teacher. Um, you could show it to a parent. I just wouldn't show it to 50 people. You'll get 50 different opinions, but it can't be that you don't know how to write an essay. This is something that you do throughout high school in your English classes. The college essay and supplemental essay shouldn't feel like it's something you're incapable of doing if you're applying to competitive colleges. Next would be recommendation letters. So colleges are looking at transcript, testing if applicable, activities with leadership and separation factor, essay supplemental essays, and recommendation letters. So colleges are looking for one from your school official, which tends to be your college counselor, or it could be uh, an administrator who works with your seniors applying to schools, and they look for two in-classroom teachers. So the priority there really is English, history, math, science, and world language. Even if you're applying for engineering, they're happy to have a world language teacher and a math or science teacher. It doesn't have to be, let's say, an engineering elective that writes for you the recommendation letter. When it comes to recommendation letter, think about the class where it's not necessarily where you got an A+, plus, but you had an A plus commitment to the class. You raised your hand a lot. You participated and took a risk, even if you didn't know the answer. The teacher sees that you help out other students who are struggling. You are someone who may have had one landmark paper or oral presentation or project but you work really hard to get to that point. Now, if every subject comes naturally to you, amazing. But the recommendation letter from the student who maybe got a B plus first semester, A plus second semester, carries a lot of weight. If you have a teacher you've known for multiple years, maybe you have a French class and it's the same teacher all four years, that usually makes a great recommendation letter. The idea is that it should be two junior year teachers, or a lot of colleges are okay with one junior year, one sophomore year, some colleges are not okay with sophomore year, so you have to do your research to check on that. The recommendation letters are not things that you see. You're gonna to wanna to waive your rights to view the recommendation letters on the common application. Why? If you have access to the letters, college admission folks will think that you helped write them and they weren't authentically written by the teacher. It's important to waive your rights to view the recommendation letters. Students like to ask about supplemental letters. I wanna send in 10 recommendation letters. No. Colleges do not want it. Two teachers, one school official. If you have one supplemental recommendation letter, maybe you did science research and you have your lab supervisor, or maybe you worked in an internship for two summers and that supervisor really knows you well, that's okay. But don't think to yourself, I need to get four or five supplemental recommendation letters. Colleges do not care. Sometimes students will send one from the president of the United States or a governor who really doesn't know the kid, they just know the parent in some capacity that doesn't carry any weight. So it's someone who really knows you intimately. When it comes to recommendation letters, if you apply somewhere early decision and you're deferred into the regular decision pool, which means you're not admitted, you're not denied, you might ask a senior year teacher to write an additional recommendation letter for that college. Or if you're waitlisted from regular decision, you're not admitted or denied at the end of March, you might ask a senior year teacher to do a recommendation letter for you as well for that school. That's something that you don't have to worry about for initial admission. <laughs> it's something to think about if you're not accepted right away to a choice school. So those are the five major components for admission. Other components that don't carry as much weight, but things to think about are interviews. A lot of schools don't offer interviews, especially the larger universities. Those that do offer interviews, it's a nice write-up that enters their system. It doesn't trump the academics. So if you have a C average and you're applying to a school with looking for an A average, 
doesn't matter how charismatic you are. The interview is not getting you in. So the idea is the interview is helpful if you already are competitive for admission, you check all the boxes and you present very nicely. That's where interviews can help. Interviews can hurt. If you come across as someone who will be dangerous on campus, might not make a good roommate, might not be open to diversity, might not be open to a global campus experience, that's gonna hurt you. One of my colleagues at a highly selective school once said about a student of mine, she's fine, but the interviewer said she wouldn't wanna have coffee with her after class. So eek, you wanna come across as interesting. You wanna come across as serious, but you can be frivolous too. You have a sense of humor. You're someone who is gonna be fun to engage with at two in the morning when you need a study break. These are types of things that they're looking for in the interview. So the interview is important. Some schools, you can actually register months in advance to schedule an interview. Wash U and Brandeis, for example, you could do them in June of junior year. Other schools, it's only once you apply, they'll invite you to be interviewed. Columbia is an example, Penn's an example. So you can't request the interview. If you're not offered an interview, it does not mean you're not getting in. If they offer you an interview, it doesn't mean you are getting in. So interview is just another checkpoint. The person interviewing you might be an admission person, more likely it's an alum, or sometimes seniors in the admissions office do them, and they write a nice report about you. That's just another piece of information. It's not the end all be all. Other factors include demonstrating interest, like I mentioned before, and the idea of showing to the school that you've done your research on them, and that if they admit you in regular decision, there's a chance you'll matriculate. Schools also might look at other factors, such as if you're a recruited athlete, recruited musician, you fulfill some type of population they're looking for. So if you're from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you're on the Zoom, you're not considered as geographically diverse as someone from Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota. It's just the reality. Doesn't mean you're at a disadvantage, but it doesn't mean that they have an advantage. Don't perseverate over those. You can't control that. Just do the best you can with the other factors for admission. So with that, I see a lot of questions here. So I'm gonna go into some of these questions. And Francis, if you wanna stop me at any point, if there are any questions you wanna address, of course, feel free as well. Yeah, I wanna just remind everyone to be extremely comfortable asking questions. You know what I'll do? I'll like incentivize, ready? If you ask a question, you get to see the cute little dog. Who wants to see the dog? Ask a question, you get to see the dog. Goldie, come here, come Goldie, so, yeah. come. Good news is there are a lot Ask of a questions, question, but if you, you want to keep dog, typing away, we'll feel free. Okay, so to see the cute I got a good question here. When colleges look within the context of the high school, how do they take into consideration the bigger picture that a student can get extra AP classes in other high schools in the city? At a study center, online, self-study, if your school offers only four, the kids are not limited to four. That is a great question. Harvard actually asks a question in the supplemental essay about what other academic enrichment opportunities have you taken advantage of beyond the scope of your high school. So that is something they notice. And that's what I mentioned before, the idea of science research, for example, or if you're going to engineering, having exposure to the engineering fields. I would say that colleges aren't expecting students to do four APs online, but they are thinking to themselves, how are they academically pushing themselves beyond the scope of their high school canon? So that is a very good question. What is the average number of APs taken in school, assuming there's no limit? That's a great question. I would ask your school counselor, particular to your school. Students should not feel like they have to take 18 APs. However, students are able to take a number of APs, eight to 10, and do really well at them. Again, while having balance and strong mental health is very important, and that's something to think about. You can ask your school counselor, students who are admitted to X university, what is their curriculum? And can, I, can I just quickly add also, a lot of students can self-study. So let's say that your school only offers you, I don't know, two APs or three. You can always self-study for an AP and then you can take it. You just have to coordinate that process, okay? Everyone right. keep asking questions. You get to see the okay. dog. Let's see so the dog. Next oh. question. Is it better to go to a specialized high school and get a few Bs or to go to a top screened high school, have all A's, everything else equal? For college admission purposes. This is a similar question that I get. Is it better to take all honors and get Bs or to take accelerated and get As? The idea is that the environment where you're in should be the environment where you academically and intellectually belong. So if you're at a certain type of high school, don't worry about the Bs once you're there. If that's the environment where the student belongs, do the best you can in that school. Someone shouldn't be taking honors over accelerated unless they belong there academically. If I have a student who got a B, in an honors math class, they work really hard to get that B, but they love the cohort of students around them. 
and they're very happy with the stimulation of conversation, that's priceless. So the idea is that yes, the A and accelerated might look better for the schools that aren't as competitive, but for the most competitive schools, it's A's and the most rigorous curriculum possible. Okay, next question. Is there a level of excellence you're looking for in extracurricular activities? For example, do you have to have one competition in your extracurriculars? Winning competitions is certainly helpful. If you're a debate champion, you're an FBLA champion, a DECA champion, if you are a Model UN best delegate, not everyone's gonna have those. And some high schools don't even give awards when it comes to actual individual accolades. So yes, having them is helpful, it doesn't guarantee admission. Not having academic honors or extracurricular awards doesn't mean you're not getting it. Okay, next question. What if you have multiple athletics, competitive soccer and varsity soccer? Is that two items of the 10? Yes, a lot of students might have the varsity sport and the club sport. You could definitely separate those. Those are two different endeavors. Um, sometimes when people report their sports, they kind of undersell themselves. So let's say this, I, I coach JV basketball, the school where I work. Let's say we have three practices a week but my kids are playing the other four days on their own. I say, you add those hours. It's still part of your overall basketball package. So you wanna think about that. So even though it's just three days a week of practice, if they're practicing seven days a week, two hours a day, that's 14 hours a week. Um, do math classes outside of school count as extracurricular activities or are they too academic to count? Those will count more in the academic sphere. Um, same question for computer classes, robotics for a kid interested in STEM. So those will be construed as academic uh, enrichment, those shouldn't trump extracurriculars. So a student shouldn't have a bare extracurricular uh, resume because they're doing a lot of academic classes on the side. They should still have some extracurriculars. Can community service be abroad or does it have to have a local impact? There's nothing wrong with doing community service abroad. I have a bunch of students who went to New Orleans last week to help out with hurricane relief, but that doesn't impress the way local community service does. So students shouldn't feel like they have to spend $6,000 to go to the most expensive and exotic place to do community service. What are your thoughts about taking classes at university during the year, which might be, be the college you want to attend? That's a great question. I know a number of schools have a program with Syracuse University and they take classes through Syracuse. So it doesn't have to be that you're taking a class at the college you're applying to. Taking a class through a local university is just as impressive as an AP. It's a college course even if it's not a school where you might apply to for college. Next question, if you apply to STEM, should your two recos be for math science to show expertise or is it better one math science and one humanities to show you're well-balanced? And I would say the latter. MIT actually wants one in humanities or social science and one in math science. So it's good to have one of each and not both be science or both be math or one math, one science. It's good to have that diversity. Next question, is SAT 50-50 good enough for BSMD? <clears throat> Great question. BSMD is a combined bachelor's and medical program that some schools have, not every school has it. Brown, BU, Rochester, U Miami, Sophie Davis program, there are a bunch out there. Those are extremely selective, even more so than a typical Ivy League school. A 1550 definitely is high enough. Does it guarantee admission? Absolutely not. But you shouldn't feel like I only have a 1550. I need to shoot for a 1590. 1550 is really, really good. Next question. If I did well in an AP class, but did not do well in the AP exam, such as getting a three, should I withhold my scores? I would say self-report a four or a five. You could self-report a three to those schools that accept a three. So if you Google Binghamton University AP credits, you would get a chart that would show you that they take a three. So for Binghamton, it's okay to self-report a three. Otherwise, I would only self-report fours and fives. Question, when should I begin taking AP classes? That junior year? So some high schools offer freshman year, some high, high schools offer sophomore year. Most high schools that do offer APs definitely have them in junior year, senior year. If you are able to take them earlier because you have demonstrated excellence in a particular subject and the AP class interests you, then go for it. If not, then don't feel like you have to take it as an underclassman. Next question, is research a must? No, research is not a must. If you are thinking of putting down something in the sciences, it definitely is helpful. I wouldn't put pre-med on an application unless your pre-med package looks really strong. Pre-med is extremely popular. And the type of major that you list has impact. So for example, some schools, males listing computer science or economics are a dime a dozen. It's not gonna separate you in any way. If you put something down like classics, 
and you have ancient Greek or ancient Latin languages as part of your high school canon, that's going to look better for you. When it comes to pre-med, if you are going to list it because your extracurriculars yield that direction, then having research can be helpful. Are college courses as impressive as APs? Yes, college courses are as impressive. It's whether it's a college course during the year or college course in the summer, those are counted as college classes when admission officers count your, your academics. They're counting how many honors you're taking, how many APs you're taking college classes. How about taking the remote class offered by a university you would like to attend? Good, go for it. Some schools look at that as demonstrating interest and they care. Some schools don't and they don't care. So for those schools that do track demonstrated interest, taking a class in person or remotely can be helpful. Question, what's your opinion on doing community college and then at Ivy University to save costs? What are some steps to take? That's a great question. <clears throat> the transfer admission process can be very selective. For some schools, it might not be as selective as freshman admission. When it comes to saving money, there's no question that doing community college for one year or two years will save you could be 80,000 a year, which is where the private schools are trending. However, there's no guarantee of getting into an Ivy League college just because you have straight A's at your community college or at your other state school where you're looking to save money. So wherever you go for college, in addition to having a really strong transcript, same idea, you wanna have really good extracurriculars, leadership positions, <coughs> recommendation letters, strong essays, et cetera. Next question. Any online college suggestions? Are there any differences between online college admission? Are you asking about like a University of Phoenix? Are you asking about the for-profit or a college that has gone virtual because of the pandemic? I'm not sure I understand that question. You can feel free to type that in. Um, next question. What are examples of online certifications? Students have done things like they've gotten their real estate license. Um, that's an example. Or it could be that, I'm trying to think of other examples of online certifications. Can't think of any at the top of my head, but the real estate one I've seen a few students do, and that's why that comes to mind. Okay, what colleges would allow athletes to go pro? That depends on the sport. Certainly division one is more beneficial for basketball, football, and certainly the power conferences give you a better chance. Big 10, Pac-12, ACC, SEC. Okay, our college now courses in the summer regarded same rigor as AP. So any college classes you take and you do very well in will look good for you. But it doesn't mean that you don't take APs during the year. Okay, if you had, let's say, one bad term in your transcript, but you had solid A's the rest of the time, will that ruin my chances of getting into competitive school? That's a great question. The application has something called additional information where students can actually put down something that maybe admission officers would never know otherwise. Let's say sophomore year, first semester, you're hospitalized for a month. They would never know that unless you write about what happened to you. Or let's say during COVID, both parents were hospitalized, were very sick, and you had to take care of three younger siblings. This is really real stuff. And your grades went down as a result. That's where you list it. Um, I had a student who had two grandparents die a month apart, and the home was in upheaval. Only way the colleges will know that if the student writes about it in additional information. So it depends how low the grades are. It depends what the blip looks like. It depends how long it is. If it was a one semester phenomenon, that's one thing versus a two year phenomenon. Okay, next question. Oh, so the question is about, um, I mentioned before I asked the question about online college suggestions for colleges that have gotten virtual due to the pandemic. My hope for you guys, if you're juniors, sophomores and freshmen is that in two, three or four years, you're all in person. Um, if colleges are still virtual in two, three or four years, we have a problem as a society. So I'm really hoping that's not gonna be the case. Colleges might offer virtual coursework, but to be purely virtual, I don't think that's the college experience you're gonna want. Okay, next questions. What should I do in summer of junior year? Research with a professor or working? If working, then should I do it for a nonprofit or at a company to gain work experience for future career? Admission officers love students who work, but there's no one right job. They're just as impressed by a busboy or someone who works at a bookstore or an usher at a movie theater as they are someone who got an internship because of their parent connections. So the idea is that if you're someone who's looking to make money, maybe it's to supplement family earnings, that will impress admission officers. Okay, so what about a letter from an athletic coach in addition to two academic recs? 
So this is important if you're going to be a recruited athlete. If you're not going to be a recruited athlete, that's not going to carry as much weight. Okay. Um, yes, if you had an 80 first semester of the pandemic shutdown, should you explain it on an application? Yeah, if there was a real reason. It can't be something like virtual learning was hard for me. It was hard for everyone. But if there's something that one particular course, maybe the teacher was a bit older and just couldn't relate to the new technology. That, that happened with us at one of our school, at my school with one of our math teachers. Or if um, maybe you yourself were sick for a few weeks during COVID and you couldn't log in, there are definitely explanations. Um, going back to the lower grades, can you say that your mental health wasn't well that year, but as the year advanced, it got better, which can be shown through the grades being better. The most important thing about mental health on an application is that colleges wanna know that you're better or you're getting better. If you're saying I'm having a struggle with my mental health right now as a senior, that, that can't, it's not gonna help you much. But if you say I've overcome it through therapy and through dealing with the appropriate channels, that's something you can say. It's definitely more common for college admission folks to see a lot of mental health struggles during the pandemic. So whoever is feeling that you are not alone and you should know that there are thousands like you and you should not feel bad about having compromised mental health during the pandemic. How many clubs do you recommend to join freshman year? That's a great question. There's no finite number. I would say every freshman here in this room or younger siblings of people in this room should think about two to three things that they're gonna really commit to freshman year. So it shouldn't be 10 things with an hour in September here and an hour in February there. Think of two to three that are really gonna be standout activities for you. How do colleges view CR grading? Is that referring to just getting credit pass fail? If so, that was the norm for second semester 2020 for sure. Otherwise letter grades are a bit more common or number grades, okay? Um, how do competitive colleges see students with disabilities like dyslexia? Will letting them know hurt the application? That's a great question. You should never be ashamed of any learning challenge that you've had to deal with and that you've overcome. So colleges by law will have an office dedicated to students with learning differences. Now, some schools might have more resources devoted to it than other schools, but the idea is that colleges are expecting a chunk of their applicant pool to have had learning challenges and to have overcome those learning challenges really well, or to be battling those learning challenges. So if dyslexia has been a part of your high school experience, do not be ashamed to reveal that and explain how despite some struggles, let's say perhaps in reading in ninth grade, you really elevated to a whole new level in 11th grade. I mean, these are types of things that will tell your story. Admission officers are reading applications in just a few minutes, it's quick. So you really wanna be able to write concisely in the additional information section. The additional information section lets you list up to 650 words, which is what the essay maximum is. Don't feel like you have to use 650. Don't do intro body conclusion for the additional information section. Just get right to the point in a few sentences. In addition to the additional information section, colleges also have a COVID specific section. If COVID it impacted you and how. So that's where you can write about if a parent lost their job and a student had to work more hours, maybe their grades went down. Like that is an important section to convey something they wouldn't know otherwise. Again, it shouldn't be online learning was hard for me because it was hard for everyone. But if there's something that COVID impacted you, I have students who are from New Rochelle, which was the first city impacted it. And they were one of the first ones with COVID. And there was a lot of fear. They had no idea what the heck was going on. That's something to write about in the COVID specific section. Okay, so I don't see any more questions here, Francis, so I leave it in your hands. Oh, I just got one question. Where can you put additional clubs and activities? If you exceed the 10, you can put that in the additional information section as well. But remember when it comes to the 10, which includes in school, out of school, during school year and summers, they're not looking for 10 crazy commitments. Four or five really are important than a few others that might be not as impressive. Is it worth doing a team sport but not holding leadership? Absolutely. There's a lot to gain from a team sport beyond being a leader that's gonna be taken with you forever. All right. So Francis, that was the last of the questions here. Thank you all so much for your questions. It's a pleasure interacting Hi, with everyone. you. Hi everyone, we're not done. Don't leave, hold on. Don't leave, I see you when you leave. Don't leave, hold on, I'm here. Hello everyone, don't leave. Okay, I want to ask a couple of questions for my guest speaker. Um, and I also want to take a moment. Can everyone also quickly type thank you to Michael 
for speaking, for giving this amazing time and opportunity to all of us. So everyone, let's take a minute to type a huge thank you so that everyone can see that we are very grateful for this wisdom and this opportunity and gratitude is always an important thing. Okay. So we have that. Yay. All right. So I, I have saw one question right about uh, okay. why you're doing that AP versus IB. Do colleges have a preference? And the answer is no. They're both considered to be very impressive, especially the IB, the higher level classes. Um, and AP, I mentioned before, different gradients within the AP structure. But if your school offers both, wonderful. If they offer one, not the other, you're not at a disadvantage. So here we are right now, as I'm speaking to you, something that I love to do to close up the Queller webinar is to ask Michael a lot of questions regarding, um, you know, just, just in general, just some questions about um, pretending that I'm a student. So everyone pay attention, ready? I'm gonna pretend that I am a high school student who knows everything, okay? This is my job. My job is to pretend that I'm the high school 16 year old and I know everything there is to know, okay? So I'm gonna ask you some questions and then I want you to tell me if this is true or if this is false, okay? Ready, ready? I am a genius, all knowing, omnipotent. I know everything. My name is 16 year old, I know everything. And I've learned, I've learned, I've been told that I'm not gonna think about college until the 12th grade. Is this true or is this false? The 12th grade is definitely be a bit too late. I would say 10th grade is a good idea to think about a strategy for yourself to get started. Some schools assign a counselor in 10th grade, some wait till 11th. If your school does 11th, that doesn't mean you're behind the eight ball. It means you might have some independent research to do on your own. I would say, think about strategically the, the winter breaks as a good time to visit campus. Those of you who might be visiting campus next week, if you're in public schools on winter break, or if you have a spring break for your high schools coming up in March, that's a good time to go as well. But definitely senior year is, is far too late. I have no interest in taking college now classes. It's just because Queller is like crazy and she's like all about the college now. I already have AP courses. Why do I also need college now classes? Or why do I need to take any college classes at college when I'm in high school? Queller, you loco, okay? Let me explain something to you. I am in high school. I don't need college classes when I'm in high school. Queller, college is for college. High school is for high school. You nuts, go. There are plenty of colleges out there that will be fine with you not doing college classes. The most competitive schools are expecting you to have academic enrichment beyond your high school canon. Whether that's science research, whether that is college now or other college classes, whether that's, like I mentioned before, like the engineering uh, programs, the idea is that academic enrichment can be very beneficial for your application. Okay, this is my strategy. Are you ready? I'm going to apply early decision to six different schools because it's easier to get in when it's early decision. And if I apply to six schools, I'm basically going to rig like the whole plan because now by applying to all of these schools early decision, one of them is going to take me and whatever, I'll just bail on the other schools. It's fine. So it's actually not possible because your college counselor in your high school can only send out a transcript to one early decision school. Uh -huh. so they're not going to send out your transcript to a bunch of schools and your rec letters to a bunch of schools. So what you're saying is, even if I try to like trick everyone around me, my counselor is still only going to send out one. Correct. Exactly. So your application is incomplete if it does not have a transcript and if it doesn't have rec letters. Okay, my plan is I'm just going to like pay someone else to write my application. Like, I'm not doing this. Like, no, like, I'm not writing essays about myself, my life. Like, I have like, you know, a Nintendo. I, like, I can't. No. So ethics are very important here. And parents, you set the standard. The kids will follow your lead. If you act unethically in this process, your kids will act unethically as adults. So think about that. It's really important. When it comes to essays, if the kid cannot write a college essay, they're not meant for a competitive college. I'll be very honest. If they're not capable of writing supplemental essays, they're not meant for competitive colleges. This is a foray into the reality of what these intro level classes will be like, what the core curricular classes will be like. And you're not gonna have a tutor writing all of these essays for you in college. Now you might have someone help you with, once you have a draft going, um, whether it's someone in the school or if it's Francis Queller, whoever that might be. But the idea is that when it comes to this application process, the student is in the driver's seat 
parents, you are cheerleaders. You're on the side. You're cheering your student along all the way while the student is the one leading it. Whenever I meet with students in my office, the student is always at the head of the table, never a parent. Okay, here's my plan. I am going to just lie on my college application. I'm just going to say that I got all A's, whatever. I got all D's. They're never going to know. Have you ever heard of self-reporting? It's a little bit of non-truth. I'm going to self-report a few A pluses. You know what? I really always wanted to get an A plus plus. I'm going to use this opportunity in my common app to give myself an A plus 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 plus. Plus. So it's interesting. There are some colleges out there that ask the student to self-report their transcript because maybe their admission office is too inundated with paperwork and they can't get the transcripts from everyone. What happens is students can self-report, but then once admitted, if they want to go to that school, the college will get the official transcript from that high school. So if it's not consistent, <laughs> if there's a mistake there, the student's going to lose their seat. So you can't self-report incorrectly. Okay. I plan to be a straight A student, but here's how I plan to do this, okay? Because I'm like really smart. I'm 16. I don't even need like, I can actually have the same brain till I'm 60. Like I'm just a genius. This is what my 16 year old self is going to do. I'm going to take the easiest possible classes I can take. Finger painting, clown school. It's probably pretty hard. No, too hard for me. Here's what I'm going to do for math class. Ready? I'm going to take pre, 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 pre algebra. Then I'm going to take pre, pre, pre algebra. Then I'm going to take pre algebra. And then maybe by senior year, I'm going to take algebra. So my plan is to take the easiest classes. In fact, I might even repeat a whole bunch of classes just because I want to get straight A's. And the best way for me to get straight A's is to keep taking those easy peasy classes. And I'm going to be a straight A. 4.0 rock star of a student. All right. So the competitive schools are looking at the curricular rigor, not just the grades, not just the GPA. So it's important that a student is challenging themselves to the best of their abilities to be competitive for these schools. So stopping with math after junior year, for example, isn't a good idea with the most competitive schools. Um, not doing a progression of bio, chem, and physics isn't a good idea for the more competitive schools. So these are things to think about when you're trying to put yourself in the position to have a best chance at schools that have very low admit rates. My grandma loves me so much. Forget these school teachers, forget these like politicians, forget these like people who went to UPenn and they're gonna write me a letter. I don't know these people. I don't care about these people. Forget these people. I'm not gonna volunteer for anyone. I'm not gonna intern for anyone because my booby can write a recommendation letter about me like you've never seen. And I'm gonna get all these extra rec letters and I'm gonna make sure that my grandma is on that list writing about how I am the dream child. So it's funny you ask that because a couple of years ago, I had a student waitlisted by a top school and the older sibling who's at that school said, why can't I write a recommendation letter? I said, because they'll throw it out and not let your brother in. <laughs> they don't care about a sibling, grandparent, parent, rec letter. It carries zero weight. So it's important to know that just because someone you know went to that school, them writing about you doesn't give them the clout to get you in that school. <laughs> so sometimes students will say, I need to ask this person because they're an alum of that school. Well, it's nice to be an alum, but the alum isn't going back there again. It's for you and your application. The interesting thing to, be, think, interesting thing to think about with legacy is that legacy means a parent went to school or a grandparent went to a school, and that's a factor in admission. There are different types of legacy. There's legacy, and there's legacy with a history of giving. Your chances are better if there's legacy with a history of giving, which means it could be financial, or it could be a parent has done interviews for a school for 20 years. Um, so that's just something else to think about in the process. Okay, I'm going to be really nice because I'm 16 and I can totally like play the part. Ready? Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for listening. We're, we're, we're finished in about, I think, five more minutes. Okay, everyone. So just try to sit tight. Five more minutes. Okay. All right. So back to my 16 year old self. Ready? All right. My plan is to be really nice to all these teachers, but here's what I'm going to do because I think it's really funny and I totally want to be the class clown when I'm done. Ready? 
after I get accepted to all these colleges and after my teachers write me these recommendation letters, I'm going to skip and jump around the school and I'm going to tell every single teacher how much I hate their guts. I hated their class. I slept through it. They were boring and how much I didn't learn a single thing. After I'm accepted to college and after I get that letter saying that I'm accepted, I'm going to let all these people know how I really felt about them. <laughs> so every acceptance letter is going to have a condition that's going to say it is important to maintain your academic standards that got you into this place to begin with. So let's say someone really just shrugs aside school after being admitted in their senior year and their grades go down, they will get either a warning letter or a probationary letter or heaven forbid, but they could be rescinded admission. So you definitely don't want to antagonize anyone if you're accepted. My plan is to suck my parents dry. I'm going to tell them they must pay full price for college. I'm going to do the absolute minimum in high school. And I'm just going to get my parents to pay. Okay, that's my plan. They're just going to pay full price for college. And I get in. Harvard, here I come. So I say parents have a very important role to play with the financial elements. Parents have to say to their kids, and it has to be an honest conversation by junior year, what they can afford for college. It can't be that senior year, a student gets in, they get excited and parents say, oh, by the way, we're not even close to being able to afford that. It's a hard conversation to have with your kid, but it's important to have it by junior year so that the expectations are leveled. The other thing I would say is that when it comes to undergraduate, you should not have significant debt for things like pre-med or pre-law when the terminal degree carries the most weight. So if someone goes to a state school undergrad to save money for private school medical or private school law, that's a better path than doing the most expensive undergrad and then there's no money left for grad school. There are certain professions where the undergraduate brand will carry more weight. For example, going into Wall Street, going into engineering. That doesn't mean that if you don't have the top brain, you're not getting a great job. But if you do do really well at one of these ranked schools, your chances could be better for landing a coveted position. But for med school, for law school, having a really strong MCAT or really strong LSAT will carry a lot of weight. The college GPA will carry a lot of weight. Having undergraduate student experience as a leader on campus and great recommendation letters will carry a lot of weight. So it shouldn't just be the brand name undergrad and you suck your parents dry as Francis said best financially. So my plan is to apply to medical school, but I heard and, and I heard that when you apply to medical school, you have to take a bunch of APs and you have to take a lot of like advanced classes. So I'm going to take AP garbage and I'm going to take every single class that is not science, not math, not related to anything health professions, but I will get like fives in these APs, but I'm going to make sure that I show that I took great APs and AP clown is awesome. So I just want to let you know, that's my game plan. My game plan is to get into med school, taking a bunch of APs, not the ones that this crazy queller is telling me to take. Right. So anyone who wants to be pre-med will have to take a sequence of bio, chem, organic chemistry, and physics in college, along with calculus. By taking APs correlating to those fields, such as bio, chem, physics, or calculus in high school, you're preparing yourself to succeed more in the academic front in college. So if someone did AP bio junior year high school and got a four or a five, they're still doing college bio but they might be able to take a higher level of bio right away or that bio class in college won't feel nearly as cumbersome as it might've been without that advanced placement class. So someone thinking of pre-med should think to themselves, how is the high school curriculum gonna position themselves to succeed as a pre-med student so they can get into med school? The med school admit rates are extremely low and you shouldn't feel discouraged if after college you do a year of research, it's pretty common but you really want to position yourself as well as you can and thinking in high school of taking strong APs is beneficial. Okay, my plan in the college application is to just like lie. I'm just going to lie. I'm going to lie about my race. I'm going to lie about my sexuality. I'm going to lie about my sexual orientation. Lie, 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 lie. But you know what? Isn't that great? Because it's going to like help me stand out in the college application. Lying is good. So I, I speak to families about this all the time. Ethics is everything. And if your kid doesn't act ethically, then what's this all for? It's something to think about. The Varsity Blues scandal of a couple of years ago opened people's eyes as to how unimpressive humanity can be. 
uh, when you have celebrities taking pictures of themselves in rowboats pretending to be a recruited athlete, like this is not the way you want a parent or the way your child should be presenting themselves. So, you know, the values that you present the admission process really reflects on your values as an overall human being. So getting back to Queller and the craziness and 16 year olds, you've told me that more than once. It's I've developed a thick skin. Thanks to you. All right. Ready? My plan is to not complete anything optional on the Queller prep application. I realize Queller that you run the program, but let me teach you a vocabulary word. Optional. It means you don't have to do it. It means it's not required. You must be confused, woman. Optional means I don't need to do it. It is optional. So I get this question a lot with some schools that have optional essays. Tulane is famous for having the optional Y Tulane optional essay. And I say to my students, they're expecting someone to do it. So it may as well be you. And the idea is that if you can market yourself in some way to look like you took more time and dedication to an application, that won't hurt you. Um, the Common App has a lot of different optional fields. And leaving it blank, it doesn't tell your story in any way. It doesn't add color to your file. Everyone here is just going to be a quick name that an admission officer is going to read in eight minutes. So the more you can convey in a concise manner, the better. Even if it's just putting your parent occupation, um, it's a good idea to be able to fill it out as thoroughly as you can. Okay. So I am a hater. And I have social media and Twitter. It's been canceled quite a few times. I hate people. I hate all types of people. I don't discriminate. I hate everyone equally. I'm an equal hater. And I have social media and I post on my social media how much I hate everyone and anyone. Isn't that Good fine? Question. I mean, I'm not using my real name. I'm just posting and they can link me up maybe not but the bottom line is isn't this a free country can't say whatever i want so anything you post on any social media site is searchable forever so here's the thing if you're reading 20 30 applications a day in a mission officer there's no 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 rhyme or reason to who they're going to search they might search you because they need a five minute break or because something you wrote in the application was intriguing. So like, oh, let me look up this kid a little more. I'm curious. They've all done it and they all will continue to do it if they're intrigued by an application. When it comes to social media, one time we offered someone a scholarship at NYU, we had to revoke it because they posted in a hateful blog. So this stuff does come back to bite you. I tell people this, don't post any picture on any social media site that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. If you have a unclean social media presence, start cleaning it up. Um, I like that Francis, I don't know if you still do it, you used to bar kids from Facebook for the months that they're working with you and Instagram and Twitter. It's frivolous guys. You don't need to hype yourself up and self promote as much as you can to take away from schoolwork and to take away from maximizing your chances for admission. So just think about whatever it is you're posting. So on the opposite side of spectrum, here's what I'm gonna do. The Common App says 650 words. I'm going to write 1,650 words because the more I do, the more they see, the better it is for me, right? I mean, it's an extra 1,000 words. Aren't they going to see how badly I want their college when I write so much more? So the Common App actually physically cuts you off if you try to exceed the word limit. So it'll say in an essay of 250 to 650 words, and it cuts you off at 650. So why am I saying that? It shouldn't be 250 either, but you shouldn't think to yourself, shoot, it's only 624. I have to find 26 more words. Don't think like that. I would say in the high 500s, 650, you'll have a good essay. And you shouldn't think I have to fulfill more flowery words if I'm only at 624. My plan is to be a stalker. Hopefully I don't get arrested. They don't, right? I hope not. My plan is to visit the admissions office of the University of Pennsylvania or whatever college I apply to. I will literally go there every single day. I will get an Airbnb. I will camp outside of their admissions office. I will knock on their door. I will mail them gifts. I will send them teddy bears with creepy little notes. I will send love letters, flowers on Valentine's Day, and teddy bears and Easter eggs. I will visit admissions so much that they'll know my voice 
my voice when I call their office. I'll get to know them on a first name basis. They have to admit someone like that, right? So there's a networking element to the admission process that you can take advantage of, and that's different than what Francis is describing. So if an admission representative visits your high school and you ask great questions and you introduce yourself after, maybe you have a follow-up thank you email, maybe an email a few weeks later with a question, that's great. But it shouldn't be that there's this continued effort on your behalf to unnaturally seek connection with someone who has many, many students to review. So you have to think about how do you stand out if you have a personal connection to an admission counselor without coming across as mentally unwell. Last but not least, my plan is to just like not study for the SAT. I'm just gonna wing it. They give the SAT at school for free. They give the SAT optionally after school. They give this, uh, everyone's like, take it, don't take it. Isn't it just like a good thing that I'm taking it to begin with? Let me just like get a good night's sleep. I'll wake up, I'll take it. You know, I'll pray. I'll pretend that, you know, it's church when it's not, but either way, it's all good. I'll pray, I'll take the test. And then maybe by divine intervention, I'll get a perfect score and I'll do well. But either way, my plan is to just wing it. I'm just gonna wing it. Relax, Queller, you're just like over stressing. Stop with the pressure. So just like an actor has to practice before a performance or an athlete has to practice before a game, same too with test prep. Now you do have something called score choice where you can elect not to send a score to college if it's low. But a test is more than just three hours on a Saturday morning. There's some effort to go into it beforehand to try to maximize your chances for success. Everyone, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you at 9.33 at night. But we are about to say goodbye to Michael Courtney. I'm going to take everyone off mute. We're going to count to three. And we're going to give him a gigantic thank you because he spends an hour and a half with us. This, this is crazy. Thank you so much. One moment. Bear with me because I need to just um, take a moment. Please hold on one moment. I'm asking everyone to unmute. And when I count to three, wait, I actually want to record this. I really like this moment. This is my one of my favorite moments in the Zoom. Okay, so everyone, good. we're going to count to three. And wait, I'm setting the, the video. Okay, we're taking a moment. One, two, three. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Let's give him like 10 thank yous because he's spent 30 you. extra minutes with us. Ready? One, two, three, go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wisdom and your wealth of knowledge. Oh my goodness, I have amazing news, everyone. We are going, Queller Prep, it, we're gonna be able to do in-person college tours. I just got an okay for that. We're running Queller's summer camp. Um, everyone, please refer a friend. Not getting any point for this. And last but not least, Michael Courtney, our final thank you. Ready, one, two, thank you, Michael Courtney. Thank you, Michael. Everyone, one, two, three. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Such a complicated doing. process, huh? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for streamlining an ever so complicated process. I really appreciate all of your help. Goldie, come here. Come say thank you to Michael. Come say thank you to Michael. Goldie, come here. Come, on, Goldie. Who wants to see the doggy? Who wants to see the dog? Ready? Yeah. I'll say goodnight to Goldie. Oh my God, look at how funny she is. <laughs> Give her a little tickle for me, and uh, I'll see you soon, Francis. All right, good night, Francis. Hi, everyone. Something. Anybody? Someone? I think they all learned something. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.